guys, it's Kayla and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. What are we discussing today? We are going to talk about the well-anticipated December 2021 Quad State Tornado. Now, we got a lot of information from the National Weather Service as well as a few other resources and we're going to talk about that today. Yes! So this was an interesting event back a few months ago, six months ago, a long time ago. And we've been waiting to do this video until we had all the information out. Uh, something strange about this one is unlike the previous tornado case studies that we've done, SPC did not actually issue their full statement for the quad state tornado. Yeah, we couldn't find anything. Yeah. You may be able to find it, but upon our research, we, we couldn't really find anything from SPC themselves that actually had a full write-up on it. Recently, we did a case study on the 1925 tri-state tornado. Edith and Kayla is going to pop up a little thumbnail right here, and you can take a look at that at your leisure. And so we're going to take a look at how this case you know, compares to that one in a sense. But before we get started, make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it and subscribe down below so you never miss another one. As with most of our tornado case studies, we are going to do the meteorological setup, kind of give you the overall what's going on, and then we will drill down to the specific storm that created the historic event. Severe weather forecasters, as well as many others within the weather community, were bracing for an extremely unprecedented weather event that would take place across the Mid-South and Ohio Valley areas of the United States. What made this event even more extreme was that this was taking place in the middle of December, when the frequency of tornadoes is much less than other times of the year. Weather conditions would come together in such a way that would create a potent storm system moving across the central United States resulting in widespread severe weather across the Mid-South and Ohio Valley regions, including significant long-track tornadoes. Not only would it become a deadly late-season tornado outbreak, but it would become the deadliest on record in December, producing catastrophic damage and numerous fatalities across portions of the southern United States and Ohio Valley from the evening of December 10th to the early morning hours of December 11th, 2021. Several days before the event, the Storm Prediction Center, SPC, was monitoring the weather conditions and issued outlooks highlighting areas of high winds, hail, and tornadoes. On December 8th, SPC outlined an area of slight risk along much of the Mississippi Valley. Due to the complexity of the forecast, some forecasters noted that there was uncertainty regarding the extent of instability, how much directional wind shear would develop, and what impacts the storms would have when developing and rolling through late in the day. The following day, the confidence in the forecast had increased to warrant upgrading the areas of slight risk to an enhanced risk from southeastern Arkansas northeastward into southern Indiana. As the intense upper-level trough progressed across the high plains of the United States, abundant moisture, dynamics, and instability dramatically increased across the Mississippi Valley. On the morning of December 10th, SPC upgraded the outlook to a moderate risk from northeastern Arkansas into southern Illinois and indicated that atmospheric conditions favored the development of nocturnal supercells capable of producing long-tracked, strong tornadoes. As the day wore on, the strong upper-level trough continued to approach from the west and provided very strong lifting mechanisms within the unseasonably warm and unstable air mass ahead of the cold front. Temperatures in parts of the Mississippi Valley were near 80 degrees during the afternoon hours, and with ample low-level moisture and strong vertical wind shear, this led to numerous organized thunderstorms later that evening. As afternoon transitioned to evening across the mid-south of the U.S., there was more than enough energy to sustain strong updrafts with maximum mean layer cape values in the 1500 to 2000 joules per kilogram range. Additional severe weather parameters calculated from the observed wind shear at the surface and aloft showed the effective layer bulk shear to be around 70 knots, and the effective storm relative helicity in the range of 300 to 400 meters squared per second squared. At roughly 6 p.m. local time, the first supercells began to form and affect the Mid-South. Okay, so from those numbers, you can kind of tell that the atmosphere was not your typical December atmosphere. We had storm relative helicity values that were plenty high enough to create supercells, and cape values that were close to 2,000, which isn't a lot if you're from the Midwest, but in the Mid-South and the Ohio Valley areas, that's 
a lot of cape and you can get spin-ups like this scenario when you have ingredients coming together like we just talked about. That's right. So those three values, the bulk shear, the cape values, and the storm relative helicity. So those give indications of instability, how much energy is there in the atmosphere so that when storms start to fire, how fast do they grow, how strong will they get? as well as what is the vertical wind shear. So when you have sufficient vertical wind shear, it helps to organize the storm. Air can flow in at the bottom and then go out the top and vent appropriately. And so it can continue to build and grow stronger. So these parameters we use in the meteorology community to help see, well, when storms form, how strong are they going to be? Yep, and if they are strong storms, how much rotation are they going to have to change a regular thunderstorm into a potential supercell? And that supercell, was the potential for it to become tornadic. Now let's get into the storm itself. At 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, or 2100 UTC, the Storm Prediction Center issued a tornado watch that encompassed central and eastern Arkansas, southeastern Missouri, southern portions of Illinois and Indiana, west Tennessee, and northwestern Mississippi. It would be the first of 11 tornado watches issued that day and evening over the mid-Mississippi Valley. Between 4 and 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, Clusters of thunderstorms developed over southwestern Missouri, northeastern Oklahoma, and central Arkansas. Due to the strong capping inversion in the lower atmosphere, storms were not able to reach severe limits. However, some of these storms did start to organize as they progressed eastward. By late afternoon, one of these storms moved into an area of much greater instability and wind shear. As the storm moved east-northeast, it developed into a very strong supercell. By 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, the storm began to rotate southwest of Searcy, Arkansas. 21 minutes later, the National Weather Service in North Little Rock, Arkansas, issued the first tornado warning for portions of Jackson, Lawrence, White, and Woodruff counties. Around 6.40 Central Standard Time, a tornado rated as EF0 touched down in western Poinsett County. At 6.57 p.m., an EF1 touched down in southern Craighead County with another EF0 touching down a little further east at 7.03 p.m. A particularly dangerous situation, or PDS tornado warning, was issued for portions of Poinsett, Craighead, and Mississippi counties, and a new tornado touched down at 7.07 .07 Central Standard Time over Craighead County. As the storm moved northeastward, it reached Monette, Arkansas at around 7.23, causing EF2 damage. The storm then reached Leechville, Arkansas, around 7.30 p.m., causing EF3 damage. The storm continued to churn its way through the Missouri boot heel, causing additional fatalities and EF4 damage near Braggadocio, Missouri, around 8.04 p.m. Central Standard Time. The tornado continued its path, crossing the Mississippi River and moving into northwestern Tennessee, where the tornado would produce more EF3 and EF4 damage before eventually dissipating around 8.36 p.m. Central Standard Time northeast of Sandburg, Tennessee. Not long after, at roughly 8.49 p.m. Central Standard Time, a new tornado formed in Obion County, Tennessee. This tornado would become very strong and long-tracked, eventually causing EF4 damage in the towns of Casey, Kentucky at 9.01 p.m. with maximum winds estimated at 170 miles per hour. Mayfield, Kentucky at 9.26 p.m. with maximum winds estimated at 188 miles per hour. Cambridge Shores, Kentucky at 9.57 p.m. with maximum winds estimated at 170 miles per hour. Princeton, Kentucky at 10.17 p.m. with maximum winds estimated at 180 miles per hour. Dawson Springs, Kentucky at 10.32 p.m. with maximum winds estimated at 180 miles per hour. Bremen, Kentucky at 11 p.m. with maximum winds estimated at 190 miles per hour. The long track tornado would eventually lift around 11.47 p.m. near the Grayson-Breckenridge County line in Kentucky. In summary, this storm cell would ultimately affect four states across the Mid-South and Ohio Valley regions of the U.S., lasting roughly five hours and producing two EF4 tornadoes. The first tornado was on the ground for 89 minutes, traveling a little over 81 miles, with a maximum wind speed of 170 miles per hour and a maximum width of 1.02 miles across. Six people died with this tornado, and there were numerous injuries. The second tornado was on the ground for almost three hours, traveling almost 166 miles, 
with a maximum wind speed of 190 miles per hour and a maximum width of 1.13 miles across. 57 people died with this tornado and over 500 people were injured. So as we've seen based on this data, this was actually two separate tornadoes and not one tornado producing a continuous track like the 1925 Tri-State Tornado. If it had been a single tornado, it would have definitely surpassed the Tri-State Tornado, cutting a path up to 250 miles or 400 kilometers across the Mid-South and Ohio Valley regions. As a refresher, the 1925 Tri-State Tornado cut a path across Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana for 219 miles. In fact, looking at the data, not only were there two distinct EF4 tornadoes, but in between them, there were three separate weaker tornadoes. The parent supercell that produced the two EF4 tornadoes later became known as the Quad State Supercell. In all, the December 10th and 11th, 2021 outbreak killed 89 people with six additional non-tornadic fatalities. The second EF4 tornado that devastated Tennessee and Kentucky became the deadliest December tornado on record. At least 667 people were injured and damages reached 3.9 billion 2022 US dollars. What's even more interesting is that the outbreak set a new record for confirmed tornadoes in the month of December, setting the record at 71. However, that record was surpassed a few days later on December 15th when a larger outbreak occurred across the Midwest US that produced 120 tornadoes. One other record for the books is that SPC had issued a total of 43 mesoscale discussions, or MCDs, throughout the course of the 24-hour period from 12 UTC December 10th through 12 UTC December 11th. 38 MCDs were for the convective events relating to the severe storms and five were non-convective discussions relating to heavy snow during the same time frame across the upper Midwest U.S. The National Weather Service issued a total of 149 tornado warnings throughout the night across portions of nine states, including Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri, Mississippi, Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana. Multiple PDS tornado warnings and tornado emergencies were also issued that day, with eight of the tornado warnings issued by the Memphis, Tennessee, and Paducah, Kentucky National Weather Service offices being tornado emergency declarations, the most issued during the month of December. All right, there's a That's... lot going on with this one. The main thing being that this wasn't one tornado like the Tri-State Tornado. This was actually two EF4s, which is crazy that you have two tornadoes that are pretty much the exact same speed and everything. And then in that little break between the two, there were three smaller tornadoes. So in the beginning months after the tornadoes went through, it actually looked like a continuous damage path, which is makes it very hard to tell the difference between a family of tornadoes or one single tornado. And had it been one continuous tornado, it would have been the record setting uh, longest tracked tornado. But, Alas, the Tri-State Tornado will hold its record because the Quad State Tornado was the Quad State Supercell. <laughs> That's right. It is still a historic event, uh, especially for December. Yeah. Um, however, it won't have the uh, longest track for a single tornado, but that one Supercell does get the honorable mention of the Quad State Supercell yep. for dropping uh, I believe it was up to 11 tornadoes with just that yep. supercell having two EF4s that lasted 81 and 266 miles respectively. So with this historic event back in December of 2021, if you were impacted at all, we'd like to hear from you guys. Go ahead, leave comments below, and we want to hear your experiences as well. Another thing that we touched on is that this was a historic outbreak for December, but then four days later, there was another one in different states, of course. This was farther out west. But still, I mean, we had 71 tornadoes with the December 10th and 11th outbreak that produced the Quad State Supercell. But then on the 15th, we had 120 tornadoes, which is just like, I don't know what's happening in the month of December, <laughs> but the weather was going crazy last year. We did mention that SPC issued a moderate risk and a lot of tornado emergencies were issued this day along with particularly dangerous situation statements by the NWS in all the areas affected. But however, even with all of that warning, you notice that there is still a lot of deaths and injuries associated with this outbreak. And I think that has something to do with the fact that it's an unprecedented event, it's in December, and it's not the typical, you know, May in Oklahoma type scenario. You have 
states that normally aren't affected in a month where not a lot of tornadoes happen, and even though we had warnings and stuff in place, it was still a pretty tragic event. That's right. And not only that, it was also nighttime too, so that could have added to some more of the casualties as well. So there you have it, the December 2021 Quad State Tornadoes. That's right. <laughs> Again, if you like what you saw, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below. It takes none of your time and it helps us out a lot. Also check us out over on the School of Weather. We're discounting it for the summer if you guys are interested in learning about the basics of meteorology and have nothing better to do with your time during, you know, the off season when nobody's in school. <laughs> Follow us over on social media, Facebook and Instagram popping up here as well as checking out our website, again, link down below. Down there, you'll also find the links to everything that we use to put together our case study, National Weather Service, and all of that kind of stuff if you're interested in seeing it for yourself. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you at the next Meteorology Monday.